Hello, everybody. Um, thank you to Dr. Woodruff, Dr. Finlayson, Dr. Frias. Thank you all. Oh, sorry. Thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, I just wanted to gauge the audience a little bit. Are there any radiation oncologists in the audience? Raise your hand. Okay, as I figured. Any um, any pediatric or medical oncologists in the audience? Okay, excellent. Who here has studied um, nuclear or particle physics? Okay. <laughs> No, no, okay. All righty, good. Well, thank you so, so much for coming. I'll, I'll try to, you know, gauge my talk and, and, and gear it to, uh, to this audience, but it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to be here to speak, uh, speak for you and, and share something which is very near and dear to my heart um, as a radiation oncologist um, near the end of my training um, with a special interest in pediatrics um, and trying to reduce the late effects of our treatment. I mean, I think um, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but you know, for an oncologist, the ultimate failure is to cure a patient of their disease, but destroy their life, um, you know, the long-term survivorship in the process. And I think that that's something which has really motivated me and inspired me. And I think that we all kind of share that vision and that's why we're all here today. So the topic of my, uh, of my talk, the next uh, 30 minutes or so, is looking at advances in pediatric radiation oncology. And um, just to, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are aware, there's been a major paradigm shift in the radiation oncology world um, and in, I was in the pediatric oncology world in general in that, you know, now more and more we have the availability to use protons. So there's a lot of questions that come up. Uh, is this something that can be utilized to spare certain kind of side effects for our patients and infertility and reproductive health being definitely uh, among those. So uh, to begin, this is the framework um, that I wanted to set up for, for, for everyone here. That the, there's a, a delicate balance that we have to understand is that we're trying to you know, do a lot of things at once. We want to balance cure as oncologists. Our primary goal is to cure patients of malignant disease. Um, that's, you know, definitely a very big, important uh, goal. But on the other hand, we have to, as oncologists and pediatric specialists and um, just human beings, want to try to minimize our footprint and try to uh, improve the quality of life uh, for the survivorship of our patients. So our, our mission is, um, I like to, you know, repeat and say in different, in different spheres, I'm sure you heard from Dr. Woodruff, is that our goal is to always try to, you know, create a scenario for the patients of the future that is better than that which we have today. Um, and I would add to that is also trying to eliminate complications that the patients of today have so that the patients of tomorrow don't have to face that same future. So um, thank you so much. So in, in regards to radiation therapy, um, I think this is an exciting time. There's so many advances in physics and biology um, that we're really hoping, hopefully pushing the needle forward uh, and as many here will agree, I think this is a very exciting time to be practicing. So thank you so much for this community. My goals of the talk today are to explain how radiation therapy has really advanced a lot in the last 50 years, particularly in the last uh, 10 or 15 years or so, um, and explain how new technologies which are available make us more able to spare fertility and reproductive health than ever before in the past. The highest technology in terms of X-ray radiotherapy is something called intensity modulated or IMRT, uh, which I'll describe in detail. And then proton therapy, which is very different than x-rays, um, we'll also talk about. And I want to get a little bit into the physics and biology. I'll try not to, to bore you guys too much, but because uh, it's important to understand the differences between x-rays and protons, um, both in terms of their physical properties, because that affects their dose distributions and how we can utilize them um, for our patients, but also the biology, because I think that's, that's a big issue um, and something that we, we try to um, explore and definitely needs a lot more work to understand the unique biology of these different um, modalities and how they might impact reproductive health. I'll then talk about um, work done by our group to analyze um, anti-malarian hormone or AMH as a potential biomarker. Uh, we developed an animal model as a, a way of monitoring ovarian health um, uh, and potentially as a surrogate endpoint for uh, ovarian reserve. And then I'll describe uh, work that we've done to try to assess whether proton therapy could be fertility sparing um, in a translational model. So to kick off, I'm sure everyone in this audience or the majority are familiar with the Childhood uh, Cancer Survivor Study. This is um, you know, a large uh, cohort study of uh, you know, about 35,000 patients. Um, initially started in 1994, but um, patients were diagnosed between 1970 and 1999. Um, and this cohort also contains 5,000 siblings uh, for their comparative group. So I, I think it's, you know, I wanted to talk about this because it's important to understand the context. There are, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, children, uh, girls, young women um, is sort of been my focus, but this obviously applies to boys and young men too. But 
Uh, there's about 80,000 girls and young women diagnosed with cancer each year. And based on the childhood uh, cancer survivor cohort study, we, we know that decade by decade, we've really been doing much, much better in terms of curing these patients and increasing their long-term survi survivorship. So at the same time, that's a wonderful, and we can pat ourselves on the back and be very happy about that. But at the same time, we need to be very mindful then of what kind of a, a reality are these patients now being faced with in terms of the toxicities of their treatment? Um, and how, for, and particularly for our interest, how does this you know, survivorship and the treatments they've received, how does that impact their long-term reproductive um, hormone production, fertility, and other issues that might result from their treatment? So this is an interesting study from the, the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study cohort. They were looking at the incidence of uh, significant chronic health conditions in survivors and breaking it down decade by decade showed that um, when you go from the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, there was a decrease in the chronic late effects of the cancer survivors, which you would anticipate, you know, there's a lot has changed since 1970 in terms of the way that, um, you know, we treat cancer. Chemotherapies have been developed. Um, you know, we're better at diagnosing cancer. The radiation has changed a lot, as I'll describe in detail. Looking specifically at um, gonadal dysfunction. So in this study, it was defined for boys as testicular hypofunction or azospermia. In girls, it was defined as post-ablative ovarian failure, premature menopause, or female infertility. And as you can see from 1970 to 1979, you know, so each year they showed a decrease in the incidence of chronic um, severe, you know, gonadal dysfunction. And if you, you know, read the paper, the authors, you know, hypothesize that one of these reasons might be the decreasing utilization of pelvic radiation therapy. So I'll admit that that's probably in part true, um, but to be fair to my specialty, I think a lot also has changed since 1970 which is um, probably contributing. So even for those patients who are receiving pelvic radiation therapy out of necessity, there's a lot that's changed since 1970, which could also explain this trend, which I hope to describe a little bit now. So to understand the historical context, this is a typical pelvic um, you know, or nodal port for a patient with Hodgkin lymphoma. So imagine in the 1970s, we don't yet have, we don't even have commuted, computed tomography. So we're just using plain films for just defining our treatment ports. There aren't effective chemotherapies available, um, but really radiation therapy was pioneered as a curative treatment for um, Hodgkin lymphoma um, you know, in that era when that was the best that we had. So kind of imagining um, the, the type of treatment port that was utilized in, res in respect to the uh, female pelvic anatomy, you can see that the ovaries were receiving high doses of radiation. And as a result, these patients experienced a significant amount of ovarian dysfunction and, and reproductive dysfunction. Over time, as um, technology has advanced, we have newer imaging techni technologies which enable us to better plan our radiation treatments and, 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 and shape our radiation treatments. So this, I wanna, you know, there's three, this diagram has really uh, three rows which I wanna walk through a little bit just to kind of have a perspective of what radiation treatment planning is all about. So on the top row is showing, um, what would, you know, think of that as like the Hodgkin lymphoma field where you just have two beams, one going straight at the patient you know, one coming from the reverse side. And it's the type of dose distribution that that creates is, you know, pretty homogenous, but it's, it's sort of giving a high dose to a large area of tissue. And, you know, if the tumor is somewhere, you know, in the middle of that space, you're really not getting such a good bang for your buck, is that you're, you're giving high doses of radiation to a lot of tissues that don't need that radiation and causing side effects as a consequence. Um, but again, to understand the context when you don't have, that was the best that they had at that time. When you add additional beams, so now instead of going, you know, just from the front and the back, you add two beams from each side, you start to have the ability to shape the radiation high dose a little bit better. Um, so as you can see, we're in this, now the middle row, we are, you know, kind of shaping the radiation more conformally around a target area, um, which is good. But at the same time, you can see that we're starting to expose a lot of surrounding areas, more so even than when we were just using two beams to low doses of radiation which, you know, kind of depending on the organ that we're talking about, um, you know, may or may not be important. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of in general being more conformal. Now, if you move to when there's even more beams or to um, oftentimes what's utilized now in terms of um, intensity modulated radiation therapy is imagine you have a, a 360 degree arc that goes around the patient. The, the radiation beam is on that entire time, but we're used to technology and computer systems to Kind of think of it as like shaping the radiation dose. We are you know, trying to keep doses to particular target organs as low as possible while delivering the most conformal 
uh, you know, high dose of radiation to the target. So even more so than with four beams, we're sort of spreading around this low dose bath. Um, and this is all with x-rays, and I'll kind of get into that in a, in a second. But, you know, imagine we're spreading this low dose bath around the pelvic tissues. And um, so, you know, that could decrease certain complications in terms of bl bl the bladder and rectum definitely can tolerate this kind of treatment a lot better. But when talking about sensitive um, tissues like the testes or the ovaries, um, this, you know, again, is the best that we have in terms of we've definitely made a lot of progress, but it might not be good enough um, as, as we'll go into. So this is what's called a depth dose curve. And I, I want to go into this to describe a little bit about the physics of x-rays and kind of why this phenomenon occurs. So here you can see that um, this is showing the relative dose on the y-axis and the tissue depth on the x-axis. And imagine you are trying to aim the beam at a target and you have some normal tissue like the ovaries, which are kind of distal to that target. Um, and, and this is representing what the x-ray does. So as it's entering tissue, you know, imagine this kind of beam of an x-ray traveling along. It's sort of building up to a couple of centimeters depth in the tissue. It kind of hits its maximum um, dose deposition and then starts to trail off as there are fewer and fewer interactions that are going on with the target tissue. Um, so this, this enables us to give, you know, kind of high doses to, the, to a tumor um, and, you know, relatively speaking, a lower dose to some normal tissue like the ovaries. But um, as, as, I'll, as I'll mention as we go along, um, it, it's, you know, if we're giving a curative dose of radiation, that lower dose of exit dose is still going to impact normal tissues like the ovaries in a way that's unavoidable. So um, that's really the issue with um, x-rays. Furthermore, um, ovarian tissues we know to be extremely sensitive to radiation. I'm sure as this audience is well aware. There is seminal work done um, by uh, Dr. Wallace and his group that showed that um, the uh, LD50 or the dose of radiation that's anticipated to destroy 50% of the ovarian primordial follicles, which we believe to be the, you know, that's the pool of ovarian reserve that we really want to try to be protecting, especially in our pediatric patients when we're thinking about their long-term reproductive health. They found that the LD50 for the oocyte, the primordial follicles, was about two gray. So if you think about that in context, so if we need to prescribe somewhere between 50 to 70 gray, or, um, you know, if you think about it in terms of um, centigrade or rads or um, 5,000 or 7,000, um, that's a very hefty dose of radiation. And if we need to... Um, try to avoid giving anything, you know, between two gray or higher to the ovaries, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do with x-rays because even if you're able to reduce the dose to say, you know, 10% even of what you are prescribing to the tumor, that's still a higher dose than those tissues can tolerate. Um, and that, that therefore would explain why, you know, up to 97.5% of patients experience um, ovarian failure when high doses are prescribed to the ovaries. But even patients who are receiving you know, with intensity modulated radiation and getting a lower dose to the ovaries, a significant number of patients will experience premature ovarian failure. And likely the reason why that is is because we've reduced the ovarian reserve even from lower doses of radiation therapy and therefore, uh, you know, the, the gas runs out sooner. So as we move on to discussion of protons, I want to set up this picture here. Is, you know, it's important to understand that x-rays aren't the only way of delivering um, radiation therapy. There's a lot of other things that are out there. You maybe have heard of carbon therapy, therapy that doesn't yet ex exist in the United States. There are centers in Asia and Europe that are using carbon therapy, but uh, and protons you've probably heard of. But the idea is that there's a lot of different kinds of, of, of uh, particles or types of radiation that can be used for treatment of cancers. Um, you know, and they all differ based on their physical and biologic properties. So this is a, a way of kind of viewing them all in context. So on the uh, x-axis, you have the quality of the dose distribution. So that um, x-rays are kind of circled here in the middle. These um, have an average quality dose distribution. And then what that means is that we are able to use technology to sort of shape them a bit and do better than we could if we were just, you know, and we did in 1970, say. But we, there's, you know, we're limited by what we can do. And, and you know, there's, there's always going to be some exit dose that's going to normal tissues that are beyond them. Um, other particles like protons, which have a positive charge, and, and we'll talk about the, how that impacts their physical properties in a moment, have a much better dose distribution because we're able to, to use that, um, the physical properties of the proton to deliver it in such a way that it can stop and not, irrad not cause radiation damage to tissues that are distal to it. Um, and there's also um, LET and RBE are on the, 
on the y-axis. I'll talk about those more in a, in a little bit. But think of that in terms of like the biologic impact. So again, not, not, only is, are, not only are different forms of radiation different in terms of their physical properties, they're also different in terms of their biologic properties. Um, and, and we'll um, talk about that. So this is, in a simple way, describing what a proton interaction with matter looks like. It hits tissue. As it, as it hits the tissue, it begins to slow. And then at a certain point, it reaches its maximum energy deposition and um, it, what's called the Bragg peak. It gives off all the rest of its energy, and then it sort of stops. And this is what that would look like in terms of a, do a dose, a depth dose curve for protons. So if you imagine we're trying to treat a tumor that's proximal to the ovary or um, you know, some other normal tissue, we're able to give the proton beam, it deposits its energy, it slows in tissue. Eventually, it slows to the point where it delivers all of its energy in the Bragg peak. And the, ideally, that would be right where the tumor is. And then it stops very uh, red, speedily over less than a few centimeters. So in theory, we should be able to spare like the ovaries with this kind of approach. In practice, you know, we can't treat a, this, uh, we can't treat a tumor. I mean, this is a single proton beam. You know, no tumor is... Um, less than a centimeter in depth, you know, we need to kind of spread that out. So this is how it's done in practice. We add materials in front of the proton beam that sort of pulls back that proton, and we give, you know, repeated numerous beams of protons, um, and in doing so are able to kind of create what's called this, a spread out Bragg peak. So imagine you had a tumor. I mean, this is, this is depth in tissue and, and percent depth. This is percent dose. So this is 100% dose going uh, for a certain depth, and then it's able, it's able to, to rapidly drop off. So we're giving no dose to targets that are beyond that frag peak. And this is showing a comparison in terms of, so if you imagine, you know, the ovary is somewhere here. This is the progression from um, photons are another word for x-rays. So as we use technology to better shape the x-rays, we're able to get that high dose away from the ovaries, but not able to eliminate entirely. And this is what pro a proton plan would, so this would be like for a patient with medullary blastoma, which is a, a, of, you know, pediatric cancers are not so common, but of the pediatric cancers, this is one that we would see often, and that these patients get what's called craniospinal radiation. So that's what this would look like. And this is what we're able to do with protons, essentially give zero dose to things that are anterior to the spinal column. Um, and theoretically, they should spare the, the ovaries from any radiation damage. Now, in terms of the biologic properties of these, um, I'm going to discuss a little bit about what's called linear energy transfer, LET, and re relative biologic effectiveness, RBE. And um, it would seem from this diagram that, you know, the LET and RBE of x-rays and protons are pretty similar. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. So as I mentioned, LET is a, is a measure of energy transferred per unit path length. And I guess a, a, way of, a simple way of thinking about this is it's the... Um, the, the, uh, the um, I'm at a loss for words right now. It's the density of, uh, it's how densely ionizing is, that's the word I'm looking for, how densely ionizing is that kind of uh, radiation that we're using. So x-rays are sparsely ionizing, meaning they travel through tissue and they cause ionizations kind of sporadically, um, and, and they're considered to be low LET, whereas the opposite end of the spectrum would be an alpha particle, so that's a helium nucleus. It's very high LET. It's sort of like the difference between a ping pong ball and a bowling ball. So like the bowling ball just shoots right through and causes ionizations, boom, 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 as it's going. And it's very, it causes a lot of biologic damage. Whereas x-rays are kind of like the ping pong ball, like kind of getting scattered around. And where it hits, it's causing some damage, but it's, it's not in a um, geographically confined space. Protons are kind of, on average, considered to be low LET. But as I mentioned, as they enter tissue, they're slowing and slowing and interacting more with that tissue. And so the LET, uh, or the density of the ionizations for protons, increases as it goes through tissue and kind of reach its, reaches its maximum point right where the Bragg peak is. So, you know, in theory, if the ovary were to be right behind where the tumor is, and we're aiming a proton beam right at that tumor and the ovary is right behind it, you know, you would think that the highest LET and potentially the highest biolog biological effect is going to be right where the tumor is. And that might, our concern is that that might spill over and, and impact the ovary in a way that is unanticipated and undesired. And this is just kind of to explain how this all fits together. So RBE is, is a way of describing the relative biologic effect. So uh, it's calculated by determining what is the biological effect for some test type of radiation like protons or neutrons or something else. And you compare that to the same dose of x-rays, what kind of biologic effect that you see. So if the RBE is two, that means that for the same dose, the new, new type of radiation you're using is twice as effective. It has twice the effect. So that, that could be like um, 
you know, primordial follicle survival. That could be any kind of endpoint, but um, basically for the same dose, how much biologic effect or damage is it causing? Alrighty, so now to move in a little bit into our, in our research, um, we, uh, in order to assess uh, these kinds of hesitations, as I mentioned, we think that protons should have a bi better dose distribution, but might have a higher biologic effectiveness and might be, you know, actually more damaging and, and counterproductive. Uh, we wanted to test this hypothesis in an animal model uh, with the hypothesis that protons could spare uh, fertility in patients. Uh, we wanted to use a, a, a non-invasive biomarker for doing this, so we selected AMH. Um, and then we also wanted to validate um, our treatments by looking at ovarian histology and seeing what the impact on the primordial follicles was. So um, since ovarian primordial, primordial follicles, I would argue, is the primary tissue that we want to try to uh, test, and, and really that's what we're trying to preserve, especially when thinking about pediatric patients. They're extremely sensitive to radiation damage, as I mentioned. Um, but it's really hard to study that, um, especially if you're thinking about how to translate this research to humans. How do you... You know, it's, it's in an animal model, it's relatively simple to, you know, look at ovarian histology and do a follicle count. But in patients, how can we, you know, assess the impact of our treatment on their follicle counts in vivo? So, so we chose AMH as sort of a, a surrogate way of, of monitoring that. I mean, AMH is a, uh, as we know, it's a peptide hormone. It's made by um, developing follicles, not necessarily by primordial follicles, but it's made by, uh, ant, you know, things that develop from primordial follicles. And therefore, it's sort of a general marker of ovarian function. But also, it's, it's, you know, some would argue that it is a surrogate marker for sort of the health of the ovarian primordial follicle pool in general. So uh, that's what we chose to uh, monitor as our endpoint in this study. So we had 124 prepubertable mice. They were CD1, um, postnatal day 21, all of them. And we uh, used AMH as our primary endpoint. We measured it in these animals based on a, uh, we developed it, or there's a technique to give to a basically a mandibular puncture blood spot of AMH. We could test at baseline one week, three weeks, and eight weeks post-radiation treatment. And we also, at, eight, at the end of eight, eight weeks, at the end of the study, were able to um, analyze ovarian histology and do a more detailed uh, primordial follicle count. So for this study, um, we chose two dose levels. We, well, we had three groups of animals. There was sham controls. There were animals irradiated with x-rays, 27 animals. And then there were animals that were irradiated with protons. We had two different dose levels that we looked at. One was a 0 0.2 gray, so that, so two, 0 0.2 gray or 20 centigrade is the estimated dose that would eliminate primordial follicles, but would likely have less effect on secondary follicles or antral follicles. And we also looked at a high dose, a single dose of 1.8 gray or 180 centigrade, which uh, would, you know, ablate all kinds of ovarian tissues, all, all follicles. And we looked at these two different dose levels to test the hypothesis that the, um, you know, that ovarian, that protons might be able to spare fertility in, in both of these dose levels. So this is just a depiction of what the x-ray treatments looked like. The animals were anesthetized. We were, we were able to deliver a, a pelvic radiation treatment using cesium blocks, essentially to block out the whole rest of the animal so it didn't have any pituitary dose exposure. Um, and then we used, uh, not getting into all the specifics of it, but we had various um, radiation dosimetry, ways of quality assurance to make sure that the ovaries were getting the dose that we anticipated they would, um, and that all checked out. Um, this is just describing a little bit what the um, experimental setup was for the, uh, for the protons. So we had those same two dose levels, but be given the physical properties of protons, we're better able to um, modulate the depth at which the protons are going. So imagine we have these two dose levels. We're giving um, some animals 0 0.2 gray, some animals 1.8 gray, but there's, I would say there's three different like, locations that I want to focus on a little bit. So we can deliver the dose, and we can position the animal and the proton beam in such a way that the ovary is getting full dose from the protons. And this, we hypothesize, would be exactly the same dose for dose. And we, we hypothesize that it would be the exact same as x-rays because we're you know, irradiating straight through the ovaries. It's, it's the same, you know, it's proposedly the same type of radiation in that dose region. Then we move the animal and the proton beam such that the ovary is now, you know, just beyond where the beam is stopping. So that's sort of like that distal spread out brag peak where the ovary is getting less than the prescribed dose, maybe somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of the dose, but it might be having some of that higher biological effect because it's at the end of range. And then we had a third condition where um, the highest dose, 1.8 acre, was delivered, but the animals were positioned such that the proton beam was stopping well before the ovaries. Um, and we hypothesized that these animals should have entirely spared AMH, and um, the follicle count should be entirely uh, similar to the controls. So this is uh, so the primordial follicle count at eight weeks post-treatment. 
you can see that this, this here, um, this is the histology controls, the animals that got both x-rays and proton therapy, the ovaries look entirely similar. Essentially, they're ablated. There's no, no surviving follicle whatsoever. Um, and as you'd imagine, um, the follicle counts uh, re re match that histology that we can see grossly. Um, at, when we're giving a lower dose of radiation, so 0.2 gray, we can see that you do see some uh, developed follicles in the ovaries, but there is a paucity of primordial follicles. So this is a dose level that you know, is affecting the primordial, fo primordial follicles, but sparing some of the more developed follicles. Now when we've uh, modulated the proton beam, so the animal is getting less than 0.2 gray, we see even more follicles, and, and there, there, are, there is some impact on the primordial follicles, but it's less so than um, in, in where we're giving the ovary the full 0.2 gray. And as was as expected, and, and we were glad to see that when the animal was positioned beyond the proton beam, even with the highest dose, um, you know, the, oh, the proton beam did stop as we thought it would and caused no ovarian damage whatsoever. And you can see that on histology and in terms of the uh, primordial follicle count, no, no difference to controls. Now focusing on AMH. So um, I, you know, I, I showed the picture of the actual gross histology of the ovary just to kind of help reference, but um, this graph is showing the AMH measurements at eight weeks post-treatment. So as you would anticipate, um, you know, if there, there are no follicles in the ovary, the AMH is uh, low in animals receiving the full dose of 1.8 gray. So this is 1.8 gray with x-rays or 1.8 gray with protons, but the ovary got full dose because of where it was positioned. Same thing with 0.2 gray because there were some, you know, some primordial follicles that were spared and predominantly um, secondary and antral follicles that were spared with this dose level. AMH was impacted, but was um, still, uh, still measurable. Uh, when we moved the animals, well, so when we gave 0.2 gray, but put the animal ovaries in that distal spread operatic peak, so these ovaries are getting somewhere between, you know, 10 to 15 centigrade, uh, you know, AMH was preserved essentially, um, you know, and you can imagine that we hypothesized that was because we might be impacting the primordial follicles to some degree, but we haven't destroyed all of them, and therefore the animal for some period of time is, is still maintaining its, uh, you know, fertility and um, uh, cycling, uh, whereas, um, and then in, in the animals who got 1.8 gray where the ovary was entirely beyond the proton beam, as we saw, no effect on the primordial follicles, no effect on secondary follicles. AMH was entirely uh, the same as controls as we would be expected. So this is just to, to, to mention, um, you know, what we saw. So if you compare the 0.2 gray, low dose of radiation, where the ovaries were in the distal spread up rag peak, um, there is, you know, so we did not see that biologic effect that we were anticipating or potentially we were concerned that we might see. So our hypothesis is that, especially, and, and there's other literature to support this idea, is that when you're talking about tissues that are so sensitive to radiation, this, this issue of biologic sensitivity is less of, an, less, of an, you know, a less of an important issue for them. It's more about the dose that matters. So if you're able to decrease the dose in whatever way possible, um, you're, able, you're able to decrease the effect. So um, this is just showing the primordial follicle count, comparing 0.2 gray to 1.8 gray, where the over was beyond the spread up rag peak. So the, there were, you know, we did destroy some of the primordial follicles. We saw before that the AMH was not changed. And I, I would liken this to the scenario shown by Wallace and colleagues where, you know, we have decreased the primordial follicle count for sure, but maybe at that time point, we're not seeing a premature menopause just yet. But if we were to follow these animals uh, longer in time, we likely would see premature menopause because we have significantly decreased that primordial, fo primordial follicle reserve. Um, whereas animals who were able to, who we were able to spare their ent ovaries entirely with the protons, we would not see that effect. Just, uh, I wanna quickly run through this. Um, this is a, some would argue in the radiation oncology community that, you know, how do you visualize the ovaries in vivo? It's, it's, it's a challenge. Um, so we wanted to kind of confirm this in a very precise way, taking ex vivo ovaries, and we developed an apparatus to deliver a similar kind of study, but think of now we have ex vivo ovaries where we're delivering proton beams of various depths. And just to quickly summarize this, this we prescribed 0.2 gray, but we, progressively move the ovaries back and back such that we're giving lower and lower doses because the ovaries are being irradiated by a different portion of the proton beam. And the final condition, the ovaries were entirely past where the proton beam stopped. So we would anticipate get, those ovaries would get zero gray. And this is a quick summary of the results. Um, you know, we saw, you know, what we would expect. This is um, on the, this is x-rays. This is 0 0.2 gray with protons, no difference. As we move the proton beam back, also significant primordial follicle depletion, 
with a lower dose of protons because now the ovaries are in the distal part of that proton beam. But as we are able to you know, move the ovary away from the proton beam and the dose it's receiving is less and less, there's less impact until we get to the point where now the ovary is just a centimeter beyond where the proton beam is stopping. We see no impact on the ovarian primordial follicle. So this was very reassuring to us to say that you know, the, the proton beam is not impacting the ovaries. And this is just a, a quick view of the histology. So as you can see, 0.2 gray, the ovaries are getting full dose from the protons. You have a sparing, this is MSY2 staining, sparing of the central developed follicles, but no, essentially no um, cortical primordial follicles. But in the group where the ovaries were beyond the proton beam, you see no effect. So, um, you know, the takeaways from this is that proton therapy can be fertility sparing. Um, you know, as we know, the ovaries are very sensitive to radiation, and therefore, we could kind of think of the ovary and particularly the primordial follicle as a very sensitive biologic dissimilar. Uh, we know it's, since it's so sensitive, if, it's, if, it's, if anything is going to be impacted by the radiation, certainly the primordial follicle will be because it's so um, sensitive. AMH we found to be a good biomarker for the uh, overall impact of the radiation treatment, and we think maybe also a surrogate biomarker for ovarian reserve potentially, um, especially when looking at proton therapy where we think it should not be impacting the ovaries. Um, it's important to mention that all radiation exposures are potentially mutagenic. So this study did not look at, you know, so we saw that the primordial follicles had survived, but we don't know are they, you know, genetically competent and, you know, to what impact. Uh, there have never been any studies to show, like in, um, you know, the um, Japanese atomic bomb survivors, never any data to suggest that the children of cancer survivors are at increased risk of genetic abnormalities, but that's something that needs to be explored further. Um, and then I, what I, what I want to end with maybe and, you know, put it back to this community is, you know, if we can use protons to spare the ovaries, the uterus, the vaginal tissues, and, and really kind of decrease our footprint from a radiation side, we, you know, that really kind of puts the responsibility on you guys. We need better agents. A lot of these patients are also getting chemotherapy. So we need ways of trying to block the gonadotoxic effects of chemotherapy. It becomes a much more important issue in that context. So um, I want to thank Dr. Woodruff, all of my team members in the, in the Woodruff lab, Sarah Wagner, uh, Soyum Kin, Allison Grover, and then the folks at the Chicago Proton Center, um, Gail Wolschak, and of course my family for all their support uh, through this work. Thank you so much for your attention.